Paul, and uh, happy birthday to Epilepsy Ireland, I should start by saying, and thank you for inviting me here today. And I'd echo Paul's comment, thank you for coming back, it's always a good sign, although I'm sure it's probably to see Maura and Sinead after me, but never mind. So I've got a talk for, I think it's three hours, is what uh, I've been given, so I hope you're sitting nice and comfortably, I'll be here for a while. Um, and yeah, I believe as, as a case study, we decided to introduce a little bit of stress into the earlier part of the day just to see if Paul could cope with that. So uh, he's got, we were using him as a case study and he's coped very well. Um, so my name is Nal Pender. I do recognize a few familiar faces around the place. Um, neuropsychologist at Bowman Hospital in the Epilepsy um, Surgical Program. Uh, I've been there for 13 years now. Um, and we've grown a bit in that time. We've got a few more people and those of you who come through that program probably recognize a few more faces there. Um, and I suppose in thinking about today, um, what we want to try and do is think about what is new in epilepsy from our point of view as psychologists. So I heard, um, I believe I, I missed Andrea earlier on, but Andrea was talking about the, the neuropsychological piece, the memory, the thinking changes. And that's a big part of what we do. Um, there's no doubt and we would spend a lot of time assessing. And I apologize to those of you who've gone through a neuropsychological assessment. It's not necessarily a, an exciting thing to do, but it's a very valuable thing to do. Um, but I suppose when we're thinking about where the biggest changes from our perspective as psychologists have happened over the last few years. It's probably in relation to wellness, mental health, um, and aspects of, of learning how to manage your illness yourself. Um, so that's what I want to talk to you a little bit about. Can you all hear me? Okay. Yeah, I suppose those of you who can't hear me don't know what I just said, really. So I suppose I'm assuming um, that everybody does hear me. Um, if I do tend to wander, if I go away from the mic, somebody throws something at me and just tell me. It's very interactive like that. Um, and I always over-prepare slides. I just kind of get carried away thinking that everybody needs to know everything. So I probably won't get near half of the things I want to say, but I'll pass it on to Paul and you can have the slides and you can have a look at them. And if anybody has any questions, we can answer them. So um, it's really just trying to get some of the messages across, getting update everybody about the things that we find helpful and what the research is saying about that. I'm kind of interested in that large bottle of gin that seems to be sitting here in front of me. I'm not quite sure what it's there for. I hope I don't knock it over. I'm sorry if you in advance if I do, I may, um, but we'll see what happens. Gin will be all right. <laughs> we'll all survive it then, yeah. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about managing lifestyle stress and epilepsy. That's what I've been asked to do. And what, what is new? Now, some of this is, might be familiar to some of you, um, and I apologize if it is, but some of it may not. So as a psychologist, um, when we're seeing people with epilepsy, particularly, we're looking at two aspects of it. We're looking in the surgical program about brain function and sites of seizures and whether brains are working as well as they should do in order that they can remove the bad epileptogenic tissue and whether or not uh, somebody will be well afterwards. So we would be involved in the neuropsychology and then what's called the WADA test, for some of you who may have done it. But the other big part when we get to know people for longer and we're working with people for longer is how do people manage with epilepsy? How do they cope with epilepsy? How do they deal with the chronic illness that is epilepsy? And in an acute general hospital in Bowman Hospital now, um, I suppose we have 13 psychologists working in the hospital. And what we're discovering now across the organization, across all hospitals, is that the management of chronic illness, the psychological reaction to a chronic illness is probably the biggest um, concern that people have now and trying to put efforts and time into knowing how do we manage the psychological aspects is going to be really important. So about 30% of people who come through um, an acute general hospital have primarily psychological features associated with their illness. So it's a huge number. Um, and the more chronic illnesses you have, the more psychological difficulties there are and the, the tougher it is to try and, and cope with that. So that's what I'm going to try and talk to you today. When I'm turning back and forward, uh, hopefully the, the mic doesn't disappear on me. So. Um, so what we mean by chronic illness, I suspect all of you in this room know this more than I do. Um, and I always have a little bit of a concern standing here as a pseudo expert, I suppose. Um, I've worked with people with epilepsy, but I don't live epilepsy. So those of you who are living with epilepsy are much more experts in this than I am in many of these things. Um, it's actually doing that all on its own. I haven't touched it. So, um, <laughs> so if somebody has extra special mind control powers and they're doing this to my screen, please stop for a little while because um, I don't know what's coming next. Um, ah, okay. I don't know who's doing that, but we'll try and keep up with it. It's either that or Paul is trying to move me on much faster and trying to get it, uh, get it moving. So chronic illnesses. These are a collection of illnesses where people have lifelong um, uh, I suppose, response to a particular type of, of, of disease. Here we're talking about epilepsy, which is a non-communicable uh, disease with has, which has various functional impairments or disabilities associated with that. It sounds very, um, I suppose, serious and medical, but what we mean by these are conditions that people live with all their lives, and they have to adjust around their lives, 
um, or just their lives around it. And this is what we're going to talk, talk a little bit about when we're talking about chronic um, disease self-management. Now, some of these you may have heard about already, some of these programs. Epilepsy Ireland indeed run a very good program, and I'd encourage everybody to do these. But what we want to try and, uh, and get around the fact is that there is a relationship between the illness itself and how you cope with the illness and your, your, your psychological response to that illness. Let's hope this works. Yes, okay, so this is the model that I'm gonna be talking about. Has everybody seen this before? No. Oh, great, okay, great, little, one little yes, okay, great. Um, so this is an adaptation of a model that's being used a great deal across the world now in terms of how we begin to understand helping people with a chronic illness of any kind. So we're running this with people with diabetes, with epilepsy, all sorts of other uh, conditions as well. So what it's telling us is that we have a condition at the center and we have a whole series of factors around it. So we have the disease features itself. Now, disease sounds very dramatic there, and I don't mean that. It's really just a description of the term. So that might be the type of seizures you have, the frequency of them, the seizure burden that we talk about and you would have heard about. What are the consequences of that? Injuries, say the physical consequences, injuries, headache, fatigue, poor concentration, those things. What's the impact of that on your, on your emotional state in your life? We've heard a little bit about the thinking impact. And how does that affect your lifestyle? And you can see that as you go around the cycle, they start to impact on each other. So the important thing that we're realizing, and this is one of the newer developments. So I've been working with people with epilepsy for about just over 20 years now, I suppose. And in the beginning, when we started working, there was no real discussion of the psychological piece. It was really just the medical management and off you go. Um, take your tablets, maybe have some thinking changes and let's see what happens. But in the last 10, 15 years, we have really begun to get our head around the other variables that can improve someone's quality of life and at times improve seizure burden and improve the disease itself. So I'm going to come back and forward to this throughout the, the talk and talk a little bit about each of those areas and how we can start to, to give people the skills to improve that. Does that make sense? Is that okay? Yeah. All right, stay with Okay. So um, what we're going to try and do is, is, is touch, on, touch on each of those. And the key piece for this is, for those of you, I know I've got the kind of the graveyard, post-lunch, warm room, Dip. So for those of you that are feeling a little bit snoozy and want to go off, the key take home message here is that there are important psychological things that you can do to manage your chronic illness that will improve um, day to day living with it. OK, so those of you who can go off for a sleep for a while. We'll wake you up when we come back towards the end and we're going back over it again. So I won't be offended if anybody has a little doze. Um, yes. Right. OK, so we're going to come back to these body maps in a moment and talk a little bit about them. But it's really just to conceptualize again for us to remind us that we have different body systems that um, can be affected in different ways in a chronic illness. And the particular one that we're talking about here is the nervous system, which is the brain and spinal cord and all its associated um, muscles and uh, muscle groups. I'm sure you're probably sick of seeing brain stuff. I'm not going to do a huge amount of brain stuff, but as a neuropsychologist, I can't help it. I just <coughs> love putting up brain stuff. Um, so we know that epilepsy is a disease of the brain. It's a disorder of the brain. It's a condition that is causing um, cells to stop working. I'm sure you've heard about this all day long and lots of time, so I'm not going to go over and over and all over again, but just to remind ourselves. For me as a neuropsychologist, what's important is just different parts of the brain do different things. They play a different role. And those of you with seizures will know that, that you have different symptoms depending on where the seizures might be. And the type of seizures that you get and the symptoms you have come from whereabouts in the brain the seizures are coming from. So it is made up of 100 million nerve cells that interact in a circuit of 100 million uh, other certain cells, and they all uh, connect together. And this is what causes the complexity of a seizure when it happens, because they all bounce off each other. And this is your brain. Okay, I'm not going to go back to too much more, uh, with lots of different parts. So probably the one that you're most familiar with is, as people with epilepsy is the temporal lobe, which is the piece inside there, where well, temporal lobe epilepsy is the one that we would often see the most in the epilepsy surgical program in Beaumont where we're looking at surgery for uh, removing scarring or any dead tissue there. So coming back now to the emotional piece. So that's just the brain bit out of the way. This is, this is a quite interesting um, set of maps. So this is, these are what I call body maps or, or um, emotion maps. So this is a study done in 2013 um, across different cultures, about 700 people mapping out, ah, um, stop it, whoever it is doing that, um, mapping out um, different physical responses that go along with different emotions. You guys are probably at a bit of a tight angle over there. Are you okay? Um, so this, I said, they followed up about 700 people, getting them to map out where they experience the physical sensations that go along with the emotions that they experience. And what they found is that there's a very consistent pattern of physical sensations that go with the emotions that people experience. So when we're talking to people who have emotional difficulties or have problems with their, their thinking, um, 
one of the big concerns is that people be labelled, there'll be a stigma, that this is all in the mind, or, or, or lots of other phrases that are going mad. And what we want to try and explain to everybody is that your brain is controlling everything. This is all your brain. Your brain is doing everything. It's controlling your emotional state, it's controlling your epilepsy, it's controlling your thinking. And that there's an interaction between the physical piece. If I move to here, do I disappear for half the audience? You can still hear me, okay, a little wrong. You can see that each of these different emotions, and it's a really interesting paper that, that, was, that was published that, that described lots of different emotions, have different physical. And the, 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 the redder and the more orange they get, the more people are, are saying that this is where they experience physical sensations. So what we know from this is, a very, and we've known for a long time, that there's a very close relationship between your physical sensations and um, your emotion, leading to this, this um, vicious circle or circle of some kind that we would use in psychology a lot. So I'll put your brain up the top there. It's controlling everything, right? So then we have these four circles. And in psychology, when we're looking at trying to help people with <coughs> emotional difficulties, we would rely on these. So what we mean by this is we see, let's say at the, at, the at the top here, you'll have some thoughts. So we need to look at your thinking, your thought pattern. Now, this is a basic model that comes from cognitive behavior therapy. Has anybody ever heard of that? Yeah, yeah great. When I was on this 15 years ago, nobody would have heard a thing. They would all look blankly at me. Uh, so that's brilliant. So that's a great step forward. And now a new thing in epilepsy is different. People understand it. So your thoughts are kicking off the whole process. So you might be thinking, let's say, I'm feeling anxious. I'm feeling, uh, I'm, I wouldn't even feel like that. I'm, I'm worried about something. I'm worried about what's going to happen tomorrow. I was worried on the way in that I put, picked the right memory stick. That I had a funny sinking train on, on the train that I, told, I brought the wrong memory stick. And I was going to put it in. It wasn't going to be holiday snaps or something. Um, so I had a thought in my head that something horrible was going to go wrong. So what happens is then your body starts triggering an emotional response. So there's a natural trigger that happens here. Um, and we'll take the fear responses. It's a very nice one because you have a fear thought. And that fear thought leads to the emotion of, of anxiety. Uh, and that leads instantly then to physical changes. And for many people, they don't even really notice the emotion. It's the physical changes that they begin to pick up first. And that would be the butterflies in your stomach, maybe the tension. Um, you're feeling a bit... A bit, a bit more uncomfortable. Um, and these are the physical sensations. And when we come back to that body map there, it was that feedback. So what that study has shown is that people, from, in many cases, humans, will use the physical feedback to say there's something funny going wrong emotionally. So I feel strange or I feel a bit sick today or I feel a bit flat. Um, and they will use those to inform their emotion. So what we begin to say is, okay, you could begin to start mapping out how you're feeling by becoming aware of your thinking pattern and becoming aware of your of your physical state as well. Those things change your behavior. So if you're feeling worried, if you're feeling nervous about something, we, the main behavior that goes along with anxiety and fear is avoidance. So we don't tend not to want to do it. So we tend to stay away from it. So we don't do things. And when we're thinking about chronic illness, one of the difficulties that people have is that they tend to avoid going to doctors, they tend to avoid getting information about it, they don't want to try and, and know. Um, that's not always the case, but it is a concern one, but we're dealing with, for example, like, um, anxiety. That then, the, the less you do and the more you avoid, it affects your thoughts, which impacts on your, conf your confidence, let's say, and your, your willingness to keep doing things, and the whole cycle keeps spinning more and more and more. The less you do, the more concern you have. Now, that's going to be impacted by lots of other things. The type of illness that you have, you might be having a bad time, bad run of seizures, you might be having a difficult situation, the drugs might not be working. That's going to impact on that cycle. And then all your own personal histories, your other life, all those other things that are going on with you as well will impact us then too. But what we want to show is that there's a very complex, tight relationship between your emotional state, your physical state, your behavior, and your, and your brain. They're all tied up into one big thing. Does that make sense? Okay. So we're going to try and see what we can do about that. Now, I'm not going to be all doom and gloom because it's, it's very positive and it's about looking forward. But we do see, unfortunately, in <coughs> chronic illnesses, and in particular in, in epilepsy, um, a risk for depression. Um, so we know that it's higher than the rates in, in other conditions and in the general population generally. And there was lots of, lots of studies have been done with this over many, many years. This is probably one of the most striking ones, which are showing about seven times the rate uh, of the normal population. Now, that's a concern, and the reason I'm putting here is not to make it seem very gloomy, but it's the fact that we should be making services available to people. We should be knowing this. We should, this should be linked in with epilepsy clinics. We should be actually having a facility available for people where they can talk about things, um, and I think that's getting better and better. It wasn't before, but I think there are greater facilities now. But if somebody is suffering from depression, it's not something that should be hidden. We're not trying to stigmatize it. We want to get people to talk about it because we know we can do something about it. And the great thing about mental health changes is you can do something about it. We can treat it, both psychologically and pharmacologically. 
So the most important thing is for people to talk about it. And that's why we're talking, that's why we're labeling, that's why we're saying it. Anxiety is probably one of the biggest ones. We've seen about two thirds of people with, with epilepsy. Now, it's also probably one of the most common mental health conditions in the country and in the world. Most people suffer anxiety at some point in their life. It's a normal human emotion and its job is to protect you. Your brain is wired predominantly to protect you and to make sure that you um, stay well and alive. Anxiety's job is to find threats and things that are going to go wrong and to stop you from doing them. The difficulty is when that goes a bit astray and we start to find things that maybe are not threatening um, and uh, that your brain is then saying, oh, I don't, do that. I don't want to meet those people. I don't want to go out there. I don't really want to go to the gym. I don't want to go there because I might have a seizure or I might meet people that I don't want to talk about. And that's when anxiety starts to cause problems. And one of the things we'll say is always do it. Do it anyway. Get out there and do it. Don't let the anxiety control it that the emotion will follow the behavior generally. So if you're sitting there, and we all have it, you've got to go to the gym, you've got to go somewhere, you think, oh, I'm just not in the mood, I don't want to go. The important thing is to go. The mood will follow with it. <clears throat> if you let the mood dictate it, the world starts to shrink smaller and smaller and smaller, you do less and less and less, and it becomes harder and harder to get places. <coughs> so we can see this in, in epilepsy generally. People with partial seizures in the limbic system do tend to have a brain-related sense of um, anxiety as well. But we know that in generalized epilepsy as well, there's an increased rate. And understandably so. It's an unpredictable, unprovoked, random event that's happening to you. You become very vulnerable. It is not surprising. Your brain is triggering this as a major threat. It's, it's, um, it's very, very um, um, predictable. But again, you need to tell people if you're experiencing it, you're not going mad. It's not abnormal. It's entirely normal. It's entirely predictable. And we want to try and get you help. And we're there and the services are there to help people get the help that they need. Um, okay, is that all right? Okay, so we know that that in turn has, is probably one of the biggest predictors of people's reported quality of life. So when you ask people about how do they feel their life is, how do they think it's going, those with depression are probably struggling to feel that their life has, has got quality. And we, we don't want that to happen. So we can see that in both of those. That the mental health, the strong mental health difficulties do have a negative impact on people's perception of how well their life is going. And we want to get that, we want to get that treated. But that's not everybody. <coughs> Okay. You heard of non-epileptic seizures? Okay. So non-epileptic seizures are an interesting group of conditions which um, are seizure-like behaviors that don't have underlying electrical activity. That's simply it. The positive thing about seizures, about non-epileptic seizures, is that they can be treated psychologically and they respond very well to psychological treatment. If you get the right treatment at the right time and it's done in the right way, they can, be, um, they can be really well treated. We have a significant number of people uh, attending the hospital in Beaumont with non-epileptic seizures. Again, there should be no stigma about this. These are psychologically related events. And generally, when we come back to that model, we'll talk about it in a minute with the physical piece. For most people, non-epileptic seizures are a physical manifestation of emotional changes. Uh, as you can see, it tends to co-occur, and we probably have about 100 or so in Beaumont every year. But again, the important thing today, it's not, a, it's not a bad thing. It's a treatable condition that can be treated if you talk about it. Okay? There's a lot of changes. Now, I'm talking about psychological non-epileptic seizures. There are other types of psychological, you can see here. Um, there are other types of non-epileptic seizures. Okay? There's a lot to take in. I'm bombarding you with a lot of stuff and a lot of facts. I'm going to talk about some practical stuff in a moment. But uh, just to kind of give you the background stuff to it. Okay? So these are just the rates. You don't need to see lots and lots of rates, but it's just um, customary in these situations to give you the information that you need. So here that we can see the rates of these emotional difficulties in people with epilepsy compared to the general population. Now, I don't need to tell all of you, but it's such a variable when we say people with epilepsy. It's a huge population. We know 40,000 people in Ireland alone and all very different with all very different types of seizures and backgrounds and life histories and everything. So it, it is very hard to, to pin down those numbers together. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to put away the, the kind, of, kind of more significant mental health and look let's, a little bit more at the, the challenges, the, the chronic illness management. Because for me, this is probably the most useful thing across the lifespan. And it's across, for all of us, these are, these are it's not rocket science, okay? So we're not sitting here giving you uh, fantastic stuff. This is practical advice that you need that, that will be useful for everybody. Now, is it very warm in here? Yes. Yeah. I think I might start falling asleep shortly. So if that starts happening, <laughs> then... It was cold, is it? Or was it freezing? We want to try and get the balance. Right. 
Do you want the air conditioning back on? Okay, we're getting somebody right. Okay, just slightly lower. Okay, well, that's fine. Look, I'm, I'm fine here. I just, I'm just conscious of you guys having to listen to me in a hot room as well. It's not. It's the worst combination. Lunch, hot room, and me. Anybody with sleep difficulties, this is the place to come to. Okay. So. What we want to try and do is take out, demystify the chronic illness piece, because I think, I liked, I liked this, this picture, because I think it does indicate the point that people find it very hard with a chronic illness to make plans. It's very hard to make predictable plans and know what you're going to do, because your illness will come and hit you out of the side of your head when you don't realize. Um, so there are lots of things, and we've done a lot of research over the years looking at what happens when people get the diagnosis and the, and the um, I suppose, learn about epilepsy for the, for the first time. And there's some work we're doing with... Um, Naomi Elliott and others in, in Trinity looking at how to tell, how what the process that people go through to tell uh, and explain, explain to other people that they have epilepsy. And that's a whole other set of challenges. When do you tell people that you care about? When do you tell new people? When do you tell work? Uh, and these are all really complex um, issues. But these are things that people have talked about in different research projects and that we see when we're working one-to-one -one with people, that there's a terrible loss. Um, what's going to happen? Where am I going to go? How am I going to work? Who do I tell? How do I tell? What happens if somebody sees me having a seizure? You don't need me to tell you this. These are experiences that I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, but these are the reported things that lots of people around the world have shown when they talk about the impact of, of epilepsy on their life. Again, it's, it's a condition which is a hidden condition. It's very hard for people to see that. Nobody, nobody sees that you have it until you have one. And then you don't know you've had it. Um, uh, and other people get to see you having something that you haven't had yourself, which is always very um, tricky. So it's difficult to get that information across. You don't have a bandage, you don't have a wound that people can see. And it is always very difficult in any chronic illness like that to get that information across to people. That you'll have good days and bad days, things will go well, things won't go well. And it's impossible for them to see. We, you've talked earlier on, so I'm not gonna, I'm gonna fly through those. But we know that the cognitive difficulties are a very significant part for many people. That it can result in difficulty with concentration, with difficulty um, in employment and in occupation and in, in education, and it can lead to lots, lots of other difficulties. Okay, all right. Okay, right. So that's the gloomy bit. All right, I'm telling you that the gloomy stuff—they're the things that are not working so well. We know that there's emotional difficulties, and they're normal. The most important piece is these are normal, predictable for everybody with chronic illness and habits. So what do we do? So you want to start getting people back on track again. So this is coming back to this um, graph I showed you at the start. So we want to try and tackle each of these. Learn. So the first point, and, and you know, we're talking to a, an expert audience here. The first piece is that you need to learn more about your illness uh, from the right sources. Google. Mm, I think we all know maybe stay away from Google for a bit. No offense to Google, but I mean, Googling your medical condition is a tricky one, and the information that you get is not regulation and control, so you need to be very careful that you stick with right sites and, and appropriate um, places to visit. Place, days like this is a really key thing, learning more about your condition. So from the mental health person, uh, perspective, it is important that you get the right treatment at the right time. Go to your GP, talk to your neurologist. They will be there to help you. They will be there to get the treatment that you need, either drug treatment or linking you in with counselling and psychology services um, because their services are there and set up. There's not as many as we'd like. First hand up. Those of you who are waiting for psychology and neuropsychology, I understand and I apologise. There is not as many as there should be, um, but there's more than there were. So the psychological therapy, which can either be group or individualised, and medication. Now, for many people, they do. They have a bit of both, and they do better with both. They have the medication piece, and they have the psychology piece, and that can help a lot. And sometimes, what you'll have in the psychology, we'll see, we'll see people maybe for five or six sessions, kind of kickstart everything, and then maybe meet them less regularly, but for a longer period of time to just kind of link in and make sure everything's going okay. Okay. So we don't need to do those because you've done all those. Oops. We. I don't want to. Right, anybody here? But this computer is just. A piece has just come off in my hand. Um, I'm gathering in no situation is it ever good when a piece comes off in your hand. Um, okay. So, self-care, right? Self-care is one probably the most important thing that we want to look at. So you need to begin. And what we want to do in chronic illness self-management is exactly that. We want to give people the skills to help manage this themselves. Because you're the people living with it, you're the people who are managing it, and we know that this works. So, information is probably the most important thing. Stress management. Now, I don't really like the word stress. Um, it's not a great word, it doesn't really describe anything, and it always gets everybody's back up when you say, is it stress? No, it's not stress. Um, so 
It's probably not the most useful help, helpful phrase, but what we mean by that is managing all those factors that are contributing to rise in anxiety, rise in the, in the emotional state. Have you come across mindfulness before? Yes. Wow, you see, this is brilliant. Oh, you're an expert audience. Um, again, if I'd have done this 20 years ago, you would have looked at me blind. I wouldn't have known what it was. Um, so mindfulness is really useful. It's, uh, we'll talk about it in a moment, but it's a very helpful piece for managing anxiety. It's just mindfulness is about being in the moment, where you are, um, knowing that you can control what you can control here. Okay, now I'm certainly not a master mindfulness practitioner, um, but it is extremely useful. Relaxation techniques. Have you done any of those? Wow, God, okay. This is great. What's that? Body scan. Body scan? Yes, brilliant. I'm going to show you those in a moment. Um, but these are really helpful because what we're doing with mindfulness and relaxation is coming back to that graph I showed you at the beginning. The relaxation stuff helps you control the physical aspect. It relaxes the muscles, it reduces the tension, get your breathing. And the, the main purpose with the relaxation exercises is to get breathing. My slow, deep breaths, okay? It just relaxes the system. And the purpose for that is that breathing, hopefully, is something you can take wherever you go, okay? And the idea is that if you practice this every day and you train your body that when you start doing these nice deep breaths, everything starts to relax. It's a process of what's called conditioning. So you're pairing up your deep breathing with a relaxed state so that when you go somewhere else, you're feeling a bit under pressure, you do your breathing, your body instantly clicks in. Now, if you watch, let's say, professional footballers, professional sports people, you probably see Johnny Sexton at this very moment taking a kick uh, against Munster. Um, <laughs> don't say nothing. Uh, that's what I'm watching here. Um, <laughs> when they go to stand up, they will take a deep breath and they will relax. And the reason they do that, if you look at um, Ronaldo or any soccer player, any of the big sport, they will do that for a moment. They take a nice deep breath, slow the system down, relax the head, relax the body, and then they'll take their, their kick. Golfers will do it too because it controls the physical response um, and it relaxes the tension. Now, I have people come in to me who'll be breathing like this and be, their shoulders will be apparent. I'm not stressed. I'm fine. You know? And they just don't feel it. You get to live with it so much that you, you have this tension in your life that you don't realize. So one of the reasons of doing the relaxation is begin to know how it feels to actually feel relaxed. When you're under pressure so much, you actually don't know. You miss, your body forgets what it feels like. So I'm going to show you some, some places that you can get that information. Okay? All right, healthy diet. I mean, there are some old favorites here that we have to put up and are really important. Okay, we'll talk about that in a second too. And the exercise. So the last three of the old favorites, they're in every single chronic illness. You have to take account of them because we know they have a major impact on, on your life and well-being and sleep. So I'll talk a little bit about those and then we'll go on to some practical strategies. Alcohol, unfortunately, and epilepsy don't really mix, um, as you've probably discovered. It can affect your medication and it can affect the risk of, of having seizures. Um, we also know that long-term alcohol, obviously, for with any chronic illness, is going to be problematic and, and reduce the, your wellness and your, your body health overall. So minimize it to modest amounts is what we're saying, or none at all. Exercise is going to be really important. The fitter you are, the healthier you are, the better your body will deal with any chronic illness. Now, that's not saying we want you all to put on you know, Lycra and sprint up mountains all day long. It's just about trying to get a regular um, amount of exercise, a nice warm glow about you with your heart rate up a little bit. <coughs> Um, I always recommend that you sit down and have a chat with somebody who knows these things better than I do. Um, but we know from the data that the, the exercise itself is going to be very good. Now, that's it. The exercise is going to be very good for two reasons. One, it's, it manages your condition, but it also manages the mood. So one of the, the starting points for any psychological therapy in a cognitive behavioral model is to get people doing things again, getting people out, active, and um, getting out into the world. So that's one of those things where your body may not want to do it, your heart may want to do it, you don't want to do it, but you've just got to do it. And then people say, well, it's raining. I'll do it when it's not raining. Now, if you do that in Ireland, it's two days a year. Uh, so there is no point saying I'm going to confine my exercise to two days a year. You've got to get clothes that are right, put on a coat, get an umbrella and just go because you're never going to go if you're going to go when it's not raining. Um, so sleep. Anybody have difficulty sleeping? Yeah. Uh, sleep is a really tricky thing to get right. Um, the more tense you are, the more stressed you are, the more worried you are, sleep goes off. Now, sleep is a behavior. It is a behavior that we train ourselves to do. All animals will sleep at some point. If we leave ourselves, we'll eventually find a rhythm, but we have to train ourselves to sleep at night and be awake during the day. Um, and if we get out of the habit, we're in, we're in a bit of difficulty. So there are lots of um, ways of managing that. So we, you, know, you don't have your sleep. Now, we know there are some epilepsy-related sleep conditions, and those of you who've gone to epilepsy monitoring or sleep-deprived DEGs who will know that's a very unpleasant experience to stay awake for that. Um, and we know that anticonvulsants can affect it. 
But without sleep, your thinking can, can be confused. You can, you're obviously exhausted. And the problem is you get into the habit of not sleeping. So as soon as you lie down, you lie down, <laughs> bing, your brain is awake, starting to think about all the things that you should have done or didn't do and or might have to do. Uh, or you might be looking and you get asleep and then you wake at about three in the morning and bing, it's time to start thinking about all the stuff. And then when you think about them the next day, you realize they're actually not that bad. Why was I lying half awake all night thinking about it? What's happened is your brain has been trained to start waking up. So sleep, again, we remember I talked about conditioning, which is that two things being paired together happen together. So the breathing and the relaxed state. In bed, the idea is, and those of you with children who've tried to teach children to go to sleep, they have to learn when they lie down, eventually they relax their body and it's really, really hard. <laughs> uh, and they don't want to do it and they're screaming and they're bouncing and they're jumping off things. Um, and then you go to teenagers who do nothing but sleep, um, except at night time, uh, all day long, uh, which I have one at the moment is doing that. Um, but the idea is training. So when you get out of the habit of sleep, um, you've got to get back into it. So the first thing to do, blue screens. How many people are using iPads or phones or computers or TVs in their rooms? Go on, be honest. I'll double that number. These are the honest people putting their hands up. But I'm going to double that number for everybody else. The blue screen is a big problem. So what we've, we've seen some research in other conditions that having that too much blue screen will stimulate the part of your brain and stimulate the things that stop we're not meant to go to sleep during daylight hours. So there's a part of your brain that starts to kick in as the light goes down, helps you get sleepy and go to sleep. When you look at the blue screen, some studies have shown that this is stopping that hormone from being released because it looks like daylight. Now, I know a lot of the new computers and new phones now have a night mode where they take away that blue screen. It's probably worthwhile using that if you can. If you can, just let it go, like the song, let it go. Don't do it anymore. Just try and do something, relax, read, do breathing, do relaxation exercises, and just help you if, if sleep is an issue. Because you're needing to retrain your brain to get back into the sleep process. So that when you lie down, and when you hit it, bang, sleep starts. We talked about some sleep exercises. There are some good websites for it. Important things, regular bedtime, regular getting up. That's really important. Try to avoid taking naps during the day. I can't do that. Um, comfortable, nice room temperature, dark, free of noise, all the usual things. Avoid... Lots of stressful things. Too many box sets of really stressful programs. You know, that sort of thing. So you're kind of really... Don't look at your emails. Work. Those of you working at college, don't do them just before you lay down and go to bed. That's never a good thing to do. Stimulants. You really want to be stopping them very early on uh, in the day. Caffeine, tea. Those of you, oh, I don't drink coffee. I just drink tea before 10 o'clock before I go to bed and I can't sleep. Don't. Stop all those things. Because if, if sleep is an issue, if it's not an issue, then keep doing what you're doing. Exercise is, is an important part of this as well. So if you have your sleeping plate, now there are other sleep hygiene behaviors, which is if you're waking up regularly at night time and it's become a real issue, get out of bed. Get out of bed, sit downstairs, <coughs> take a little while until you're absolutely exhausted, crawl back up the stairs and connect in with, um, there's a sleep clinic, there's a number of sleep clinics around Dublin which will um, do sleep training as well with you. So it's very good. So coming back here, we're managing the physical piece, managing the, um, the emotional piece. There's some really good resources around. So these are quite good. Now I'll put these up. So some of these, a lot of information stuff here now. Um, and I'll, I'll hand them on to Paul. So right, 10 minutes, okay? Uh, so we can have that information. All right. Take a deep breath, fasten your seatbelts, because I've got to go really fast for the next 10 minutes, okay? I've just got a, um, it's gonna, something from Paul there. So the important piece. So medication management is only one piece. The self-management is the other piece. And this is where we want to really start um, getting on. So this is this taken from Epilepsy Island. It's really very good. Learning more about your epilepsy, learning more about what's wrong. Well, most of you have probably seen this. Look at your goals. What do you want to try and achieve? At school or education or self, obviously sitting down, writing out what it is you need to do. I'll just put this up because I think it's quite a nice model to remind people what it is they need to do. You know, it's important exercise. I understand the risk of alcohol. I understand it's eating. These are all just all self-management techniques. We all understand it. It's the knowing doing discrepancy we talk about. I know I need to do it. I can't do it. And this is where you might sometimes need help in trying to get, get that together. Knowledge is probably the most important thing. Learn about your epilepsy. Learn about your condition. Learn about the effects of your drugs. Learn about your triggers. Learn about the things that impact on you that you can control. Because one of the big factors we learned about the psychological piece is people feeling out of control. Now, epilepsy as a condition, already you're out of control. So you need to try and get it back on top of as much as you can. I think this is a really important one. By being educated and informed yourself, you can start telling other people in your lives around you, 
in another way. Now, hopefully, with this research that's been going on at Trinity, there'll be an app that's produced and a booklet for people to allow them to start learning when, what do I do when I want to tell work, when I want to tell friends, when I want to turn, you know, have a start a new relationship? How do I educate and tell other people about epilepsy? We know the stress piece. We've talked about that. This is a nice checklist again. This is the, the same thing I talked about, the physical, the thoughts, the emotion, the behavior. How, what are you doing in terms of your thinking? It's affecting your emotional state. What are the physical consequences? And what are you doing? Okay. Again, just sitting down, getting your head around how you are. What's your self-care strategies? What do you do? How do you take time to mind yourself? These are useful reviews. I'll come on to the market in a second. That's a nice website as well in terms of knowing how do I manage the mental health piece? Because what I want to get out of this for today and poke those people who are next falling asleep because we're waking them up now again for the last piece, right? We want to get out a confidence for people to begin to start knowing that there are parts of this condition that they can manage themselves, that they can control themselves. Okay? So I'll show you the mark. So have those, any of you seen, most of you seen this? I hope everybody in the room has seen this this day. Right? Okay. So in Beaumont, so as we are realizing over many years that the emotional piece, the relaxation, the, the mindfulness is becoming increasingly important. But there was really... It was really difficult for people to get access to the resources they need. Where do you do it? You know, you don't necessarily want to listen to Californian whale sounds. What do you do? How do you get useful information about mindfulness? So one of my colleagues, Jenny Wilson O'Reilly, with colleagues in psychiatry and, uh, and nursing in Beaumont, put together this website, which gives a whole lot of information. It's free to use. The website is, um, I'll show you in a second, there it is, beaumont.ie, M-A-R-C. Um, uh, stands for Mindfulness and Relaxation Center. You can go on, there's a lot of information there, and in particular, this is the, you click on that, and it takes you through to this page, which has a whole lot of relaxation exercises, mindfulness exercises, they will guide you through it. We got these done professionally and properly, based on the, on the current research. So you find your way through it. The one that I like, and it says that they're a good place to start, is the simple relaxed breathing. It's a five minute exercise that just gets you relaxed. That's all it is. And for those of you who find it hard to sit down, Clear the decks is a really nice five minute one that just when your head has melted and everything's flying around, you don't know what to do, just put it on, put the headphones in and just follow the instructions. That's all you have to do. I would recommend you do one of those every day. A five minute one, just lie down, relax. If it's particularly the insomnia one, if it's on this sheet, there is an insomnia one there as well. Oh, Sarah, is it? I can't see. It. Somewhere here. <laughs> Somewhere here. <laughs> My brain is like, okay, I can't focus anymore. It's too much coffee. Um, so the insomnia one is great if you're having difficulty sleeping. You'll be gone before the end of it. It's about 28 minutes long, and you'll be unconscious, fast asleep, snoring away. Um, so it's a great one to have. We put on the piece about intervention. It is important that if things are getting on top of you, to try and link in with somebody, get the help that you need. The STEPS program, have any of you been involved in this? Yes. Yeah, it's a brilliant program. This is the self-care uh, from Epilepsy Ireland, it's their, it's their self-care program, chronic C self-management program. I'm sure there are other people here who can talk a lot better than that than I can, but it is one that's worth linking into. Um, there it is there. Um, it's still running, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then we have one, those of you attending Bowman Hospital, we have one as well, Better Health, Better Living program, which is again a six-week, two-hour-a-week program for learning to manage your chronic illness. Um, and it's, it's a mixed group. We did look at epilepsy ones as well, but there's lots of people with different chronic illnesses. And I think we kind of, we've tried to get it right. It seems to be a better outcome for people when they're mixing up together because the issues are the same across different illnesses. But you can have access to that. And we also have a, a mindfulness-based stress reduction program, which is another six-week program, which you can get access to as well. The, again, there's some resources here that you're probably familiar with already anyway for these. So the next three minutes. Simple advice, things to do. These are, again, I'll have all these up, so you don't need to worry too much about getting them, I'll, I'll give them to you. So, there's a number of different phases, and this is all simple practical information that's evidence-based. So, what we know is that managing the mental health is gonna be extremely important. Get that out of the way first. Regular, frequent, decent exercise, but don't forget the basics. Oh. Okay, now psychologists, we like to complicate non-conditioned positive reinforcement, is what we call it. But basically, it's fun. Uh, it's just doing things for no reason because you like doing them. Uh, and it's really important because our brains need it. Our brains need that positive emotion to keep going, right? So we have something called mood-dependent memory. 
mood event memory is where you're, when, depending on the mood that you're in, your memory and your brain will will um, draw from those memories more often. So if you're in a, if you're in a negative mood and things are going down on top of you, we know in depression this happens. People are more likely to be pessimistic about the future. They're more likely to remember things that have gone wrong. They're less likely to think about things that they'll do positively in the future. On the other hand, when things are going really positively and things are and you're in great form, you're optimistic, you're more likely to take a chance, you remember the things that have gone well. And this has been demonstrated experimentally. So that we know that people need a certain amount of positive reinforcement fun every day. Um, so just it doesn't have to be massive, it doesn't have to be huge, but just you need to do something. And standing back and looking at yourself each day and saying, what do I do that I really enjoy today for a bit of fun? It doesn't have to be massive, but it really is quite telling. If you're saying, I can do anything, um, that's quite important because you need to start loading up the, the fun bank, really, as we call it. Um, there are lots of ways of, do, of doing this as well. Your diet is going to be important. The sleep we've talked about, the relaxation. And getting out, getting involved, helping others. And it's a great thing about an organisation like Epilepsy Ireland. You have an opportunity to do that. Okay, yes. that's a really nice one. This is the mindfulness piece. It is as it is. You can't stop the waves coming, but you can learn to surf. This is that famous mindfulness piece. You can't hit it. You can't stop all of this stuff that's going to come at you. But you can try and begin to start living with it. And that's why the, the chronic illness programs, the chronic disease programs, are going to be really very valuable. And that's what's new in epilepsy. We never had this before. You now have access to a vast amount of information and people there trained to help get through this. You know, this is the... I like this because it's kind of everything coming in on topic. But actually, when you stop and look at it, these are all the positive things. They could be all the things that are not going wrong. But the relaxation, meditation, group support, imagery, reading, taking time. And many of us actually stop and take time to just stop and just look after yourself every day. We're racing around all the time. You're either managing people, managing you know, each other, minding kids, going to work, going to school, managing the seizures. All these things are going on. There's so much happening all the time. And before you realize it, the days pass. You've got to stop, 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 stop. Slow down, take a breath, look after yourself. I'm not saying be selfish. I kind of am, actually, I am. Uh, I'm saying to be a little bit selfish. What's that? Exactly, yeah. Take the time. Take the time to learn about this and to take the time for yourself. You have the permission to do that. You have given you permission to take the time. Because it is really, if you don't take the time, you'll get sicker and sicker and sicker. And then you have more seizures, the stress will kick in, and you'll be looking at more medication, the whole cycle goes down. What we're trying to do is that cycle is spinning one way, we're trying to stop it, and we want it spinning back the other way. We want it spinning back in a positive way. Okay, I'm getting nods from the back. Um, these are all just useful bits of information. It's more really for afterwards, I've put it up there so you can have a look. It's just, again, more hints and tips that you can use to help challenge the thinking, challenge the emotion piece, but I'll give them on the, on the, 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 the slides when you see them afterwards. Again, this is a really nice, that's that. Um, that's a different version. It's the English thing that we talked about. Getselfhelp.co.uk is a good one. Again, they just show that cycle between you know, how you're thinking affects how you're feeling and what you're doing. Okay, so we go on for this for hours. So, what we're trying to do to finish up, and I hope in a very short amount of time we've been able to pack that in. In terms of what's new in epilepsy, what's new is that we learn and we know now that the psychological piece, the quality of life, how you look after yourself, can really have a massive impact on the illness. It can give you the control that you need and give you the opportunities to move forward. Now, not always. It's not a magic bullet. It's not going to cure everything, but it's just going to help take the focus away from the epilepsy uh, uh, and make epilepsy a part of your life, not your life going around the epilepsy. And that's really what we want to try and do in this piece. Um, it's not easy. I never said it is. It takes work. But if you put the work in, it would be beneficial and you'll feel it yourself. What we want to do, as I said, is reduce two things. Do two things. We're going to reduce the negative impact of the illness on, on, on your behavior. And, okay, no, nobody's going to do it, okay. And, oh, I'm going to come back to that in a second. Reduce, improve your overall function. For those of you, and I didn't get a chance to talk on it, but those of you who are caring for somebody, there's a whole other issue there about the impact of caring on somebody, the emotional impact the, what's called care or burden, which is associated with significant amount of depression um, and other difficulties. And there are a lot of programs now available for carers to help um, themselves too, in terms of those who are caring. But that wasn't really the focus today, but I wanted to just flash it in red for those of you that are. Um, there is help out there as well, uh, if you can get the time. So, okay, I'm going, I'm, going on. I'm going to stop because I think now you're all freezing, are you? <laughs> okay, I'm going to wait. Anyway. Thank you all for staying awake. Those of you that did, I appreciate it. I hope it was helpful to you.